Hello, my name is Cliff Sarantine. I'm a naturalist, a writer, and an advocate for protecting Nova Scotia's increasingly rare forest biodiversity. I'm standing here in the middle of a remarkably rare forest. The forest around me is a rare and hidden wood of old growth hemlocks. We'll take a look at some of them later. This is an excellent example of a real forest though, a real Acadian forest. We have trees throughout here at all different stages of life, from new saplings right at the beginning of their life cycle to ancient trees with five and six foot diameters that are many centuries old. A forest like this is an excellent example of biodiversity. From the very soil, which is rich and friable and loose in nutrients, a single grain of this contains millions and millions of various beneficial microorganisms, microscopic bacteria and fungi and such, and they all work together to create a harmony that traps nitrogen and other nutrients in the soil. They work together to work the soil, along with things such as earthworms and wood lice, and they turn the soil constantly and keep it loose and friable so that the plants have a healthy medium in which they can grow. Young trees benefit from the wisdom of the old trees. You see, the old trees actually, as they grow older, they learn how to protect themselves from pathogens and insect depredation, and even larger animals, such as mammals that browse upon them. And they share this knowledge through an underground network comprised of roots and fungal mycelia, that's threads of fungi that live under the ground. They share this information with the young trees so the young trees know how to defend themselves. And if the young trees don't have really large root systems so they can get access to the resources they need to protect themselves, the older trees, in fact, all the trees will band together and share nutrients with the weak ones to help each other. A forest like this is cooler than the world at large. Out beyond this forest, today is pushing 80, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Within this forest, it's a low 70. And that's because the forest respires. It moves water from the ground up into its needles and leaves and releases it into the air, which has a cooling effect and keeps the forest underneath the tree canopy cooler. It does this because it creates a better growing environment for the trunks and everything else in the forest. The forest is a mutually supportive super organism. But that's, but that's a natural forest, a wild forest, a biodiverse forest in its natural state, such as this bit of Acadian forest. Though this is predominated by hemlocks, we have many other types of trees here. I see beech, I see birch, I see various maple, rock maple, striped maple, and many other trees here, as well as all types of, as well as all types of understore flora. There is a tremendous wealth of biodiversity here, and it all works together to support each other. And the animals, the fungi, all of these work together to create an environment that scours the air of carbon, creates oxygen, and provides nutrients and mutual protection to everything that shares the woodland. Later today, I'm gonna to go to one of the massive, truly massive pulp plantations that comprise thousands upon thousands of acres hidden just outside of ready visibility from the roads. And we're gonna take a look at the understory of those forests. You're gonna see that unlike this forest, which one can easily walk through, which is cool, which is pleasant, a pulp plantation forest is so dense with trees in many places one can barely move through it. The structure of the ground is turned over, jagged, difficult to walk through. It's very difficult for a person or even an animal to move over such ground. We're going to take a look and see how pulp plantation land compared to a healthy forest like this is like comparing a desert to a Garden of Eden. Now I knew there would be people who would doubt that trees like this still existed in Nova Scotia at least not outside of national parks. Here's one. To my knowledge, this is the largest hemlock in Nova Scotia. There may be larger, but outside of national parks, perhaps provincial parks, assuming they haven't been raped by the pulp cartel, this may be the largest hemlock in Nova Scotia. It is at least five feet in diameter. This is a truly ancient, massive old tree. This is a grandmother tree. A tree like this, in a biodiverse wild forest like this will have roots that spread out for a hundred yards all around it and it will have an influence over hundreds of yards all around it through extensions that are created by the networks of the other trees and the mycelia that are under the ground and this tree will share her ancient wisdom the wisdom of how to defend herself and how to thrive 
in this environment, she will share this with all the younger trees around her. She's an old tree, she's sick, she's starting to split. I don't know how long this tree has, it might be a year, it might be a generation. This is a very old tree. And as she passes away, if she follows nature's course, she will move many of her nutrients down into the soil. They will travel out through the roots and then through the fungi of the mycelial network into the other trees where those difficult to obtain nutrients can then strengthen those trees. And those trees in turn will support this old grandmother tree as long as they can, for as long as she can manage to survive. And if she needs it, they'll even give her nutrients. There's been documented cases where trees have been broken off at the stump, and yet those stumps live for, and yet those stumps live for decades, even centuries beyond. And it's because the trees surrounding those stumps support them. They don't just let them pass away. They take care of their own. Amazing. I wish I'd had the camera turned that way. A great horned owl. I know it's daytime, but uh, my voice must have disturbed an owl. A great horned owl just flew from one of the old growth treetops over there to another and there it goes again and my voice is disturbing it. But this is a biodiverse forest. We have owls, not just great horned owls, we have many kinds of owls. You might be able to hear the birds and the trees around me. As we get toward evening, there'll be the sounds of mammals coming out. Right at my feet here, there are rusula mushrooms growing. There is a huge diversity of ecology in here. All this ecology works together to create the superorganism that is a forest. The forest isn't just this tree and that tree and that plant and that mushroom and that raccoon. The forest is a superorganism. When left to its own devices, it has evolved over millions upon millions of years for each component of that organism to support the life of the next. The forest takes care of itself. A pulpwood plantation is rather just a collection usually of spruces that have all been laid out in a certain way and forced to grow on a certain piece of ground. There's virtually no biodiversity, virtually no mycological, virtually no richness of microorganisms in the ground to capture and hold nutrients. The soil underneath is not really friable, it's all turned and destroyed, all of which you're going to see at our next stop. These are the kinds of trees that should exist naturally in Nova Scotia. A forest like this, an amazing, an amazing towering forest like this, is a treasure that we have deprived our children of in order so that we can sell our wood for a few dollars per ton to pulp, to, to pulp cartels to be turned into pellets and sold overseas for so-called biofuel which are, there's no such thing, but that's a matter for another documentary, or to make paper. To give you a sense of the scale of this tree, I've put my bowie into this tree. This bowie is 13 inches long. There's perhaps half an inch of the blade sticking into the tree. So to give you a sense of the scale, imagine that going across. This is an enormous old tree. And it is the biggest that I know of back here, but there are many trees back here that are close to it. All the forests of Nova Scotia were once like this, and greater still. Here we have Acadian forest in its natural state. That birch in front of me has a two foot diameter as well as the one center screen just beyond. It's very cool in here. We have a well-developed sheltering canopy. And look how green it is under the trees. We have a mix of leaf cover in the duff of the forest. We have a striped maple there. We have a rock or a sugar maple, we have ferns, we have a crystal clear brook down there, look at the water rippling. We have many young trout in this forest cleaned crystal clear water and a number of skaters over the water. My wife and I often come in here late in August and in September 
to harvest mushrooms. It's filled with edible mushrooms, many varieties. The coolness of this forest, the coolness and the clean, sweet smell of the air is simply incredible. This is what a mature Acadian forest should be. A mix of trees, in some places coniferous, such as hemlocks or red spruces, even pine. I'm up in the highlands. We don't ordinarily see many pine up here due to natural forces. And in deciduous forests, a mix of various trees, birches, maples of different kinds, beeches, the odd hemlock thrown in there, smaller trees such as striped maple, pin cherry, black cherry, choke cherry, various wild apples. The list goes on and on. This is a healthy woodland that provides many tons of food for wildlife. And any place where you'll find the odd conifer growing in a break or a, or a tangle of fallen logs that become shelter animals like deer can take cover. And in the old dead standing snags and up in the trees, other types of wildlife can take cover. Woodpeckers will make holes, later owls will make, move, later owls move into some of those holes and others, bats will move in or flying squirrels. For them, this place is essential and it's really essential for us too. These great old trees capture carbon, thousands of tons of atmospheric carbon, trap it in the wood where it stays unless we pull it out of the ground by cutting down the forest. This is a sample of the dirt from this deciduous forest. Look at the blackness of it, the richness of it. Look at the presence of organic material in this dirt. This dirt is full of nutrients. This is a healthy forest, a super organism where everything lives in a beautiful balance. There is life, there's death, there's challenges, there's opposition between the creatures of the forest, but it's all in balance. It all supports one another. And it will do so until we kill it. Here I scooped a little bit of duff away from the ground so that we could examine it with a moderately powered microscope. Notice the gray white simple structure of this earth. There really isn't much indication that there's a whole lot of activity of anything going on in there. There isn't much indication of nutrient which would show up as rich and dark or varicolored, nor is there much indication of the threads that would mark the networking of underground mycelia. It's a very simple structure. It has but one purpose and that purpose is to produce conifers. We have here square miles, dozens of square miles. What you see here is forest in which all the hardwoods have been selectively removed. If this forest were left to its druthers, it should look like that old forest you just saw. But rather, the hardwoods have been selectively extirpated I can see some of them have been manually cut out and probably in the past this forest was treated with glyphosate to kill the hardwoods. Hardwoods are more vulnerable to glyphosate than softwood forests. So when the glyphosate is sprayed over the forest at the right time of the year, the hardwoods absorb the toxic chemicals, the spruce don't, and the hardwoods die, as long with any herbal undergrowth. All that's been allowed to grow are red spruce, white spruce, and in the boggy areas, black spruce. Not too different from the boreal forest one would find in the subarctic. This is a dead zone. Dozens and dozens of square miles of it. This is what crown land looks like, with so much Nova Scotia, thousands of square miles of Nova Scotia crown land now looks like. Devastated ecosystems, utterly, utterly devastated.
What you see behind me is an immense pulp plantation. You can see it here from the drone as well. I discovered this place only three weeks ago. I came here last week with a drone with two charges that's almost an hour of flight time and flew it miles and miles all around and this pulp plantation goes on and on thousands upon thousands of acres. Every 640 acres is a square mile and this covers square mile after square mile in every direction. Now I don't know if all of this pulp plantation belongs to one owner or the crown, that I don't know. But what I do know is that from the air, all you see are vast expanses of these conifer trees. From the ground, if you go over the ground, you can see stumps here, here, here. You see all these stumps where the hardwoods that used to live here have been mechanically cut away. And you see fallen trees. And you see the ruination of the understory plants. There just isn't any biodiversity under the trees. The reason we don't see much in the way of return the naturally occurring varieties of trees including deciduous species that are normally present in the woods of Nova Scotia. We don't see that return because very much of this place has also been treated with glyphosate. It kills the understory plants as well. That's kind of a side effect. They don't really care about that so much. It's that naturally mixed Acadian forest that provides a healthy combination of food and shelter for wildlife. You don't have any of that in a forest like this. Listen. It's quiet. It's dead. There's nothing in these woodlands. Nothing.